So, anything special we want to do since this is the Christmas episode? We start out with <laughs> Dear Santa as sung by Shadaisy. Should we sing the Christmas shoes? We were going to do like a parody called the Christmas song, do you remember? We never did it. <laughs> we were gonna the song was easy the Christmas dildo. <laughs> Oh, where is that? That come? sounds really familiar for some reason. I think you must have actually. And I said remember that. doing the voice of coming up on the Hallmark Channel. Oh, yes. This Christmas deal, though. <laughs> must have been a fake commercial or something. We've done too many of these shows. We can't really remember anything that we've done before. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield. This holiday season, Mommy seems to have lost that spring in her step. <laughs> and Big Anklevich. But this year, that's all going to change. Mele Kaligimaka! Welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. I'm Rich Outfield. We're not going to go, dear Santa. I've been so good this year. I'm, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. Go. I don't know the song. <laughs> well, you know that much more of it than I do. I didn't know there was such a song, so. Methinks thou dost protest too much. <laughs> Uh, welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. This is our holiday special for the uh, year of 2014. This also feels like our second episode of the year 2014. <laughs> it really does. That's that's kind of weird. I think I've been here twice in the last six months. Yeah, it's been so long that you tried to turn at the wrong place when you were driving to my house. That's true. We were here in April, and we were here in October. <laughs> And here we are in December now. Yeah, I think that's about it. And uh, we've got a story for you. The story is called Dear Santa. Dear Santa. See, it, uh, they don't pronounce the T for some reason. Santa. Because they're from some ungodly place. Uh-huh. They don't pronounce T's. Like they would say mountain. Uh-huh. Oh, continue. It's called <laughs> Dear... Dear Santa. Okay. By, by B.D. Anklevich. You don't pronounce the T in that either. Well, it comes right before the C-H, so it's okay. All right. (laughs) Uh, So this is our holiday story episode? Yeah, this is our holiday story episode of the year. Uh, We got an email a while back from uh, Josh Roseman, good friend of the show and famous trombonist, who said that he wasn't going to be able to uh, get a new Secret Santa story written for us this year was that the same email where he told us to burn in hell Uh, probably Uh, i think that's just attached that's like his special little signature thing that oh okay thank goodness (laughs) (laughs) because i've seen it in every email he sends to us so i don't know if it's maybe it's not just his signature maybe he just says that to us every time it's not just josh though (laughs) it it might be one of those things if if it's from a galaxy brand tablet oh right right it says Burn in hell, doom stiffers at the <laughs> sent, Instead of saying sent from my iPhone, it yeah. says burn in hell, rich and big. Say that. <laughs> but yeah, we so we don't have a secret Santa story for this year. And so we thought we would do something a little different and whip up a story ourselves. Rish wrote a, a Christmas story. I think he's actually still writing the Christmas story. Uh, he's got the notebook right there by his elbow. I tried to finish it today, but uh, couldn't do it. <laughs> he's so he's close. That'll probably be our Christmas extravaganza for 2015. And yeah, when Rish mentioned it, I figured, okay, well, I will try and write a story. And I thought about it, and I actually came up with. I usually I don't know what it is, but you've challenged me to do it before. I think write a Christmas story, you know, and I always say that I have no Christmas related ideas so this time around i just tried and i forced an idea upon myself and and wrote it so a forced story is headed your way everybody i hope you like it now who did you corral into producing this one it was justin charles who edited he he's starting to style himself as r08ot because uh he edits all of our shows these days it seems well, he, he's the only one who still cares. 
Yeah, that, and he also likes to call himself a minion. He he sends me lots of pictures with those little yellow guys with the, the one eye wearing the overalls and the little goggles. <laughs> yeah, and saying stuff like that. So yeah, he he does the work of a minion or an O eight O T. Well, hey, thank you for uh, for doing this, and I know it was short notice, considering you wrote it right before Christmas. That's right. Yeah, I wrote I mine it mine during Christmas. <laughs> so so yeah, here it comes. Hopefully, you enjoy it, and uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes when the story is over to talk about it. Enjoy. Hmm. Uh-huh. The Christmas dildo will be right back <laughs> after these commercial messages. Dear Santa, by B. D. Anklevich. Here, honey, his mother said, placing a sheet of blank paper and a marker in front of Jackson. Why don't you make a letter for Santa? Ask what you want most, and he might bring it to you on Christmas. He looked up from what was left of his breakfast and smiled at his mom. Jackson was only six, but he knew how important it was to be a really good boy on days like this. He'd heard his daddy screaming at his mommy the night before, and a few crashing noises, too. Now mommy had a black eye and a scab on her lip where it had split. And who knew what other bruises under her clothes? He had to be especially good so that mommy didn't start crying like she usually did on days like this. He didn't want her to be sad. Okay, mommy, he said cheerily. Thank you. Mommy smiled at him. You're welcome. I like your good manners. Jackson knew she would. He always said thank you so that Mommy would smile. He liked to see her smile, and she didn't do it very often. Now get to it, she said. He took the marker in hand and went to write, but he only got Dear Santa out before he had to stop. Mommy had said he should ask for what he wanted most. What would that be, he wondered. What did he want most, more than anything else? He thought of toys that he would like to have, like the rescue bots that his friend Kyson sometimes brought to school in his pocket, even though they weren't allowed. He liked rescue bots, but they weren't what he wanted most. The more he thought about it, the more he realized what he wanted from Santa. Mommy, he said, can I put my letter in an envelope and mail it myself? What? She said, looking up from the couch where she was sitting with her head in her hands. Oh, um, I guess you could do that. I think we still have stamps in a drawer somewhere. Let me see if I can find them. That was good. If he was going to ask Santa for what he wanted most, he probably had to make sure Mommy didn't see it. Quickly, he wrote his request. Writing quickly was hard. Jackson had only learned to write when he started kindergarten last year, and he still wasn't very good at it. Mrs. Saborio... His teacher kept telling him that he had to pay more attention when he wrote, because some of the letters came out backwards if he didn't. Jackson didn't have time to pay attention to his letters this time, though. He didn't want Mommy to stop him or take his letter away. He thought Santa could probably figure out backwards letters as well as Mrs. Saborio. Maybe better. After all, Santa must get letters from millions of kids his age every year. He finished writing his request, signed his name, and quickly folded up the paper. Okay, Mommy, I'm done, he said. Can I have the envelope? Sure, Mommy said. Can I see your letter? No, Mommy, it's private, he said, using the word that meant no one else can see. She'd taught it to him all the way back when he was potty training several years ago, and reminded him of it any time he wanted to run around the house without his towel after his bath. Oh, well, okay. She'd already found the stamps, But now Mommy had to search for a while to find an envelope, too. Eventually, she located them in the back of the junk drawer under the birthday candles. She helped Jackson stuff his folded sheet of paper inside. She let him lick the envelope because he'd asked her. Once he tasted it, though, 
He wondered why he'd begged for it. The envelope tasted absolutely awful. He asked for a drink to wash the taste out of his mouth, and then sat down to address the letter. Everyone knew Santa's address. It was just the North Pole, and he'd learned to write his own address in kindergarten last year. So, soon he was finished. Okay. Mommy said. Let's go put it in the mailbox. Mommy put on sunglasses before going out. It wasn't bright, but the big glasses did cover the black eye nicely. She took Jackson by the hand and walked outside with him. Hurry, it's cold out here. They ran outside, their slippers flopping on the sidewalk, to the mailbox. Mommy opened it up, and Jackson stuck the letter in. You've got to push up the flag, she said, and Jackson did. As they hustled back to the house to get out of the cold, Jackson noticed that the mailman was already coming up the street. His letter would be off and on its way to the North Pole in no time, taking his Christmas wish to Santa. Jackson had tried so hard to be extra good this year, but his daddy had still yelled at him a lot, so he didn't know whether he'd succeeded or not. He felt in his heart that he belonged on the nice list and not the naughty one. His request was an unusual one, though. He didn't know if Santa would be able to give him what he wanted. But he really, really hoped so. Craig sat on the couch in front of the TV. He was a little disgusted at how hard it was to find something worth watching on Christmas Eve. It was Christmas specials everywhere he looked. That or It's a Wonderful Life, a movie which he couldn't abide. Sappy, stupid crap. On Spike, however, he found that they were rerunning some MMA fights. That was pretty good. The wife had gone to bed already after he'd had his Christmas Eve fuck. He was glad. He didn't need her out here aggravating him. She'd actually tried to say no when he'd started pulling her shirt off. Maybe she was still sore at him for slapping her when she'd spilled wine at dinner. He couldn't help himself. He'd gotten so angry. It was Christmas, and she was supposed to make everything perfect. Why couldn't she ever manage to keep it together? She was always pulling shit like this. And then, the nerve. She'd actually tried to say no. Well, he'd nipped that in the bud. He might have some attitude adjustments to make with that woman in the coming days. She was starting to forget who was the man around here. His musings fled his mind when the gay-looking Mexican fighter managed to take down the big, bald, black one. He hopped on top of him and started bashing away. Yeah, he said. There was nothing that Craig liked more than a good ground and pound. There was a thumping sound from up on the roof. What the hell was that? Craig muttered, looking away from the TV momentarily. He quickly looked back, though. The grounded fighter was starting to bleed from his nose. This was really getting good. Yeah! Kill him! He said. There was another thump. But this time it wasn't from the roof. Instead, it was from right beside him. He looked to his left and saw a pair of tall black boots standing in the fireplace. Holy shit, Craig said. Santa? He was early. Wasn't Santa supposed to wait until everyone was asleep? What was he doing here now? Santa stepped from the fireplace in a display of agility that was certainly magical. The opening wasn't big enough for him to get out, yet here he was. He was a very big man. Santa must have stood six foot three, and he had to weigh in at 350, maybe even 400 considering his height. He looked agile and lithe, however, unlike most of the shambling, obese people Craig had ever known. Ho, ho, ho! Santa laughed. Up late watching the fights, huh? Craig smiled. Yeah, it was just getting good. I understand you like to use your fist yourself, Craig, Santa said. A surprised look spread across Craig's face. You know what, buddy? Santa continued. You've landed yourself... On my naughty list, your son Jackson seems to think it's time you picked on somebody your own size. Santa cocked his arm back and smashed his gloved fist into Craig's face. Craig flew back several feet, crashing to the floor. 
Santa just punched me in the face, he thought. What the fuck? He just punched me in the face. Before he could even process this, Santa was dragging him up off the floor. I understand you like to smack others around. Well, this Christmas is when all that stops. Santa stepped back, then jumped and planted a flying kick into his chest. It felt like a mule kick. Again, Craig was launched airborne. He flew back and bounced off the wall, leaving a small dent in the plasterboard. Craig landed on the floor, dazed. Santa had just kicked him. A flying kick, like a fucking ninja or something. The room was spinning. He tried to get to his feet, but his mind seemed unsure which direction was up. It kept insisting that up was actually east and a little downward. From the corner of his eye, he could see this monstrous Santa bent over and reaching into his sack. He pulled out something that looked like a supersized candy cane. He held it in one hand and absentmindedly thumped it into the other. Craig knew that the sound it was making as it smacked against Santa's gloves was not the sound of candy, but rather hardened steel. It might be painted to look like a candy cane, but what Santa actually had in his hand was a Christmas-themed crowbar. Craig stumbled to his feet and turned to run. He had to get away, or at least get himself a weapon to fight back with. No, you don't, Santa said, and threw something at Craig. Three somethings, in fact. They splatted against Craig's back and arms, halting his progress. He looked at the one on his arm and saw... A gumdrop? A gooey gumdrop with a string coming out of it was attached to his triceps. Santa yanked and started reeling Craig in like a fish on a line. He reached back and swung his arm, and the strings attached to the gumdrop snapped, setting him free again. He dashed for the kitchen. There had to be something he could use as a weapon. He heard Santa's boots thumping ponderously behind him. In the kitchen, he looked around and spied the empty wine bottle from dinner. That ought to work. He'd seen it in movies a bunch of times anyway. He took the bottle by the neck and bashed it against the countertop. It shattered, leaving a weapon with lots of vicious-looking jags on the end of it in his hand. He turned to face the red-suited fat man heading his way. In a momentary standoff, Santa stood on one side of the kitchen with his candy cane crowbar poised, and Craig stood at the other side with his broken bottle of Christmas wine ready to strike. Since when did Santa become an avenging goon anyway? He thought. Whatever happened to a right jolly old elf? Craig looked at Santa's massive size and guessed that he would have to strike quickly. Santa surely wasn't fast, but if Craig let him in close, he would probably be able to use his size to overpower him and win the day. Craig screamed a war cry and charged, thrusting his broken bottle up towards Santa's throat. Santa pivoted and tried to avoid the unexpected attack, but he was too slow after all. Craig plunged the bottle into his neck with a satisfying splat. There was a gurgle and a wheeze, and Santa collapsed heavily backward onto the floor. Craig stood over Santa's bleeding bulk, panting and shaking, more from the flood of adrenaline than the exertion since the fight had been very short. If you come to fight, Fatty, you better do what it takes to win, Craig said, exulting in his victory. He leaned back against the counter. Santa may be vanquished, but Craig's head and chest were still throbbing from the two blows he had taken. He looked down at Santa as he gurgled and wheezed his dying breaths. What had he said earlier? Something about his son asking for this to happen? It was probably time to go wake him up, dash those visions of sugar plums from his head, and show him what happens to someone who tries to defy Daddy. Santa gasped one last time, then went silent. Craig went to one knee and looked at him. His long white beard was soaked with blood, and his famously rosy cheeks had drained away to a chalky white. That's right, bitch. Mess with the bull, and you get the horns. Then Santa's eyes snapped open, and Craig backed away, panicked. A grin spread across Santa's face, and he raised his hand and snapped his fingers. There was a momentary blinding flash of light. When it faded, the only thing red was Santa's suit. The blood was gone, the wound was gone, and a hale and hearty Santa Claus stood before Craig again. That's right, bitch, Santa said, raised his arm, and stove in Craig's skull with his candy cane crowbar. Jackson woke up, trembling in bed. 
he was sure he'd heard some kind of commotion out in the front room. He thought he should go out and see what it was, and maybe wake up Mommy and Daddy, but he was afraid. He knew Daddy wouldn't like being woken up. He would yell, and he might even hit him. Also, Mommy had told him he needed to stay in bed tonight, because if he went out early, Santa might not bring him any presents. He hoped that Santa would bring him what he'd asked for, but he knew it wasn't coming in any box or bag. He really had no idea how Santa might make Daddy go away forever, but he hoped he would. He'd been really, really good, so he felt like he deserved a special present from old Kris Kringle. He stayed in bed as long as he could stand. At last, he got up and tiptoed to the front room. When he got there, Jackson's mouth dropped open, amazed. Illuminated by the glow of the television was a huge man in a red suit. He was bent over, stuffing something into a big green velvet sack. He stood and, with effort, threw the sack over his back. He looked around the room at the out-of-place furniture and the dent in the wall and snapped his fingers. With a flash of white light, everything was returned to its normal place, and the dent in the wall disappeared. Then the man headed toward the fireplace. Santa, Jackson whispered. Santa stopped in his tracks and turned back toward Jackson. He winked, then turned away again. Jackson looked at the mouth of Santa's sack and thought he saw hair poking out, black hair like his daddy's. Then Santa placed a finger aside of his nose. It was a gesture that Jackson had never seen before. He knew what thumbs up meant and what drawing your hand across your throat meant. Mommy had done that one lots of times when she was warning him that his crying might make Daddy mad. But the finger aside the nose thing was a new one. Then Santa nodded and slipped into the fireplace and rose up and out of sight. A moment later, Jackson heard Santa shouting, Merry Christmas! As his reindeer led his sleigh away into the foggy night, Jackson was so excited. He would have to run into their bedroom to tell Mommy and Daddy that he had seen Santa. Or maybe, maybe it would just be Mommy that he would be telling. everybody welcome back i doubt you enjoyed that story i mean wait i hope you enjoyed that story that's what i was supposed to say it just warms the heart doesn't it it does it does when santa grants that special wish and I, i'm sure that the hallmark channel will be calling to yeah adapt it. they'll be picking that up soon so uh, do you want to do a cast list okay our narrator was rich outfield scratchy voice I don't notice it, man. Rish is saying that he's sick today and his voice sounds bad and scratchy and like it was, you know, recently put through the ringer. I'm not hearing it. I don't know. You you guys can mention in the comments whether... Well, at, at work yesterday, everybody was saying, you look like an open diaper in the in like the Nevada sun. Uh, and I took that to mean that I, they didn't think I was feeling well, but it could just mean... I, I think just they were just what you look like. <laughs> yeah, I think they were just trying to finally put put a finger on it and just say, you know what? You've been here a while, but I, I finally figured it out. You look like an open diaper. Uh, yeah. So so six scratchy voice. Rish was the narrator. Renee Chambliss was m the mother. And don't forget Halgar Van Kluth. The father was played by Dave Robison. And Santa Claus was voiced by Big Anglovich. So there's your cast list. Terrible. The end. Thanks for listening, everyone. And have a happy holiday season. 
So uh, I guess oh, we can talk about oh, there's it if more. you want to, or do you want to do you want to let people go their way? No, we can talk about it. I, I suppose it's traditional. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why they continue to listen to the show. Okay, so that, I, as far as I know, you wrote this for the show. I did. I wrote it for the show. Okay, I mean we've both done that this year, but you also wrote you wrote unfortunate. For the show uh, a couple years ago, right? Oh, well, that's right. Yeah, yeah that was the first time you'd ever written a story and said, "I'm writing it for the show, so that we'll have a show to go." And yeah, I think we had uh, issues going with the show where, like, every story was farmed out to somebody, and they weren't at a point where they could get it to us yet, and we hadn't had an episode for like a month, and so we're just like, "Screw it, we'll just do something right away." We used to care if we hadn't had an episode in a month. <laughs> Yes, there was a time. Well, which was easier to write, Unfortunate or this one? Probably this one, to tell you the truth. I would say it was probably less than seven days from the inception of the idea all the way to the finished product of the story. And I did it all in one sitting, which is not something that I do very often, but... Yeah, was I, this when you had to go to the auto shop? Right. They said, hey, buddy. And they, I don't know why they said buddy at auto shops. But they said, hey, buddy, it'll be about 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> if you want to go take a dump, it'll be about that long. And what, three hours later, they're saying like, hey, buddy, we just got your car up on the uh, on the lift. <laughs> yeah, it was like that. Yeah, I, this place, often you make an appointment. I mean, it's at the, it's at, it was at the dealership. So that's already... I don't know. It seems like that's already trouble. You're already asking for it if you're going to the dealership to get your car fixed. But my stupid car is not very common in the United States as yet. And all I needed to do was get tires. But it's impossible to find my tire, the tires that fit my car anywhere. I I went to a couple of different tire places and they were all like, "Uh, yeah, we, we don't carry those. We can order them in, so if you call us on Thursday, we'll have them ready for you on Saturday. But of course, I don't remember to call them on Thursday to get these tires put on. And so what eventually happened was this guy at work looked at my car, and this was like the day before Snowmageddon was supposed to hit town. They had talked about a big snowstorm coming to town. And uh, one of the guys I worked with looked at, uh, looked at my car and his way back in from lunch. And then he came and talked to me. He's like, so are you, uh, you going to get your, your tires changed tomorrow? Because I, I was looking at your car and I, I, that looks like it'll probably be a death trap come Monday when you try and drive that on the snow. And I don't know what it was, but it was something about the word death trap <laughs> that made me think, oh, hell, I better get my tires fixed tomorrow then. And so, yeah, death trap is such a reassuring phrase most of the time. Yeah, something about that word being applied to my car made me think I better do something. So yeah, I I got up early the next morning and I went in to uh, to get my tires fixed. I had actually stayed up late the night before and finished up my other story. I was. I'd been working on this thing for like a month and a half, and it turned out to be like a 25,000-word novella by the time I was done. But I stayed up late, and I finished that thing off. I wrote like more than 2,000 words to to get it done that day. And then I was like, okay. So tomorrow, when I go to the shop, I'm going to start writing on that Christmas story. And I kind of thought about the idea and how I wanted it to go. And yeah, I took I have a tablet that comes with a little... Uh, basically a full size it's like a nine tenth sized keyboard it's a little smaller than a normal one but it's nearly a full size keyboard and i took that with me to the auto shop and i sat down and i started typing and yeah three hours later like you said the guy came in and said hey buddy yeah we're having a real hard time with your tires out there i don't know what's what's going on there we're having a real hard time stretching them on i don't know what hard time the hell they were having but well it, 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 it was snowmageddon how, how well they get the tires <laughs> for you snowmageddon when? hadn't quite hit that was it was supposed to be on on the way like later on that day like right around you know the time they finally let me go was when it was supposed to hit it, it turned out it never hit at all snowmageddon never arrived there was a little bit of snow and some rain and stuff but 
Yeah, it was so, it was such a, one of those letdowns. And I rushed off to make, and spent hundreds of dollars on tires to make sure that I lived through Snowmageddon and then it didn't happen. But, uh, but yeah, they came out like three hours after they'd started to tell me they were still having a hard time. I think four hours was when they finally finished. It took like an hour per tire to get my car ready. But on the bright side, I wrote the entire time. I wrote for like four hours and I wrote 2,500 words and wrote the story from beginning to end without ever, you know, I think I may have gotten up to go to the bathroom. I was going to say in one sitting, but that might have been two sittings. I don't think I've ever done that before. It wasn't, you know, a complicated story. So it's not an amazing thing. It's not like I wrote 10,000 words <laughs> or something, but uh, but it was a full story from beginning to end. Well, that's good, but uh, it still doesn't excuse the four-hour thing, right? No. <laughs> I mean, it's not like you look back on that and, and you smile, even though at the time it was insufferable, right? Right. Yeah, no, I don't say, oh, well, that was that was good. That's what I hoped. Although sometimes I know you've said that you uh, you do that, where you're like at, in a waiting room and you start writing and then they call you in and you're like, wait, uh, how about that guy goes first? Because I'm, I'm, I'm right in the middle of like a really good part here. Please don't make me go now. Like, well, we can just leave you there. Another 45. Oh, okay, no, no. <laughs> Which room? Yeah, but. Well, that's where they're going to leave you for the next 45 minutes. But yeah, it was annoying and yet cool, if you know what I'm saying. Oh, well, and now we've got an episode. Yeah. I'll tell you, my daughter was sure annoyed, though, because she was at home watching the child by herself and by the time I finally got home, I felt so bad. It had been like half the day that she'd been sitting there all Saturday by herself watching the baby. And I'm just like, ah. I took her to the store and said, I'll, I'll get you some ice cream to make up for it. You can even have the expensive stuff. Yeah. Try the Ben and Jerry's flavors that you've only wished you could eat. So if you hadn't written that story, what would we have done for this episode? We would have not had an episode, probably. Do you care to tell me what inspired this story? I was passing by a television that had a commercial on, and there was... Wait, wait, what was it the commercial for? The Christmas deal? <laughs> like, yeah, yes, it was the Hallmark third, Channel. Third year they're showing it. <laughs> Playing the Christmas John deal. Bosley, <laughs> Maureen Stapleton. And Jonathan Taylor Thomas. <laughs> In a story that will put a smile on your face. But yeah, I just, I saw a commercial where, I don't even know what it was for, but basically kids were putting letters into a big old fashioned kind of looking mailbox. That made me think of kids, right? I thought, I mean, that's something that could be a Christmas, because I was kind of casting about for a Christmas idea, because, you know, I... Had I pledged to you or something that I would write a Christmas story? or Well, the way I remember it is you said, well, Roseman is off on his uh, tromboning tour across the Southland, and he won't be able to get us a Secret Santa story, so we'll just have to use one of yours. This is what you said to me. Oh, right. And I said, well, I don't know. I don't really story. And you said, I think what you just said was uh, that you don't have any stories, but I know you have this, and I know you have this. And I said, well, I don't really want to use those. And you're like, well, fine, then I, maybe I'll write a story. And I chuckled because I knew you wouldn't. <laughs> and then here we are. You did. Yeah, I was I was casting about looking for ideas, and that seemed like something kind of like a jumping off point. You know, Okay, what would somebody ask for? And what would be something weird, something different, something... And I, I, I tried to think of a, a Doonstief type idea, you know, something that's not your your normal run-of-the-mill kind of... Not the, the Hallmark Holiday Hall of Fame type idea of Dear Santa, but instead, you know, something off the beaten path or whatever the phrase would be for it. And yeah, the idea came up of... What if Santa became the avenging angel, became the uh, the one that came down and took care, took out the trash? And so, yeah, that, that's kind of where the idea came from. It seemed like a good idea for a, a nice kind of a quickie, a uh, triple word score length type story. 
So I thought I, I thought I could pull it off, and I suppose I sort of did. So you don't think you'll be expanding this one into a novel? No, I don't think there's much more to tell. But I bet if you really sat there and put time into it, you could. I mean, you could probably do that with anything, really. So yeah, something we've been talking about a lot lately is uh, you and I have been trying to sell our stories, our work. And nobody gives a crap about short stories. <laughs> they only care about novels. And, and that's I understand that. I mean, it's, it, Abby warned us years ago that nobody would buy our short stories. And I just, I don't think that I have it in me to write a novel. Whereas I, I don't think it's as daunting to you. You're just like, well, someday I'll get to it. I'll start making the transition to writing novels. Uh, it's not that I don't want to. I mean, that sounds cool. And especially if there's the promise of, well, more people are going to read it, more people are going to buy it, and more people are going to care if you've written a novel than if you've written a short story. Not that I, I don't want to write novels. Uh, but I, it just seems like it would take a different process, a different mindset, and a, a level of dedication that maybe I don't have. But I was thinking about like screenplays that I've written or short stories or novellas that I've written and seeing how difficult that would be to expand to novel length. And yeah, I think you at one point in the past said, well, you could do that with any of your stories. You really could. You just, you know, have to find a, an angle of something that can, you can expand on, or you just use the short story as like the bedrock and just have what happens in the short story happen along the way of the novel and, and, and all that. And I just, yeah, I don't. It can happen. I mean, if you take a look, not that this turned out well, but you take a look at the film version of Lawnmower Man. Okay. Lawnmower Man was a short story that was quite different than the film. Yeah, there's a very, very, very small amount of the movie that actually comes from the short story. I believe King actually sued to have his name removed. From Did he? Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, no longer says it's based on a short story by Stephen King. They did have a, a tiny part where the lawnmower is going around and kills somebody, I think, at some point, and, uh, which sort of happens in the story. But anyways, somebody took a look at the short story. I mean, you could take, for example, this story and say, okay, this is opening scene of the film, and then you can go expand it into what Santa's doing, you know, why he would do this, or, you know, just the... I don't know. There's lots of things that you could do. If you really sat down, I mean, I don't have the idea now, so I couldn't, can't go any further with it. But, you know, if you sit down and you look at something and try and think of lots of what ifs, you could come up with something and expand it into a novel. I don't know that there's really a lot to this, but just the idea that Santa would do something like this is uh, not typical. So you could. Ask yourself, why would Santa do something like this? Is Santa what we think he is? Does Santa just answer whatever your whatever your wish is? He may bring you the dolly that can cry, eat, drink, and wet. <laughs> How does that song go? <laughs> A little baby doll that can eat, sleep, drink, and wet? Can't remember. Is anyway. this the Sh run Daisy song? <laughs> it's from Run Run Rudolph. Well, I mean, we can talk about it if you want to. No, I, I don't. It, but did he, <laughs> was Craig, well, no, what was the little boy's name? The boy's name was Jackson. Oh, geez, we've got to talk about that. <laughs> See, none of you guys know this except for Justin, because you haven't read the text of the story. Although you should put it out there for people to read if okay. they want to. But Jackson was spelled J-A-X-O-N. I mean, it was just one X away from a big green rabbit. I, this is something you enjoy doing. You get a perverse <laughs> pleasure from it. There's there's no beating around the bush. There's something deviant and psychosexual about you giving these kids the effed up spellings of names. And Why Jackson with an X or where that comes from? Uh, there is. I've seen Jackson spelled with an X. And I've seen some kids named just Jax. J-A-X. There's just something foobar these days about the way people like to name their children. And I I find it, yeah, I, I get a perverse pleasure out of naming anybody who is on the younger end of the spectrum uh, with, with a crazy millennial style name. Or they're probably not even millennial style anymore because I suppose all these kids that our kids now will be part of some other generation that's called Millennial Y. You sent me, was it you? 
or, or on Facebook or something like that, a list of the most popular names of this year, of 2014. Yes, I did. I, and it I was posted horrific. that. horrific. <laughs> it was like you see pictures and dis- depictions of these tribal uh, child soldier things going on in <laughs> Africa. That was the kind of reaction that I had. It was just like if, it. If I recall correctly, the number one most interested girl name was Adelaide. <laughs> Okay, that's not a millennial name. That's a there's no one left alive named Adelaide kind of name. <laughs> that's one of the things with millennials is they try and pull out the really, really old names for kids. That was another thing. On that same thing that I linked to, they had a link that was for hipster, the coolest hipster names. And yeah, they were all names that were kind of like old fashioned sounding. But like Atticus, I think, was one of the names that's now cool. The the name that I that's, thought see, that's a literary reference. I dig that. I mean, that's like you name a kid Buck because you like Buck Rogers or something like that. I'm like, okay, that sucks, but you like Buck Rogers. You know what I mean? I was if it's a kid named if somebody names their kid Atticus, I was like, well, all right, you like to kill a mockingbird, that's fine. There was other ones like there was there's names that, that like that that are referenced to things like one of the top the the names that was jumping up the list really fast was. Khaleesi. Yes, I do remember that. Yes. <laughs> I, I, it was way, jumping way up there. But on the boy list, in like the top 10 or 5 was Zachary, but with a TH, Thackeray. And I was like, <laughs> F you, man. They, no, guys. That's that. Oh, geez. Thackeray is another. That's a last name, I think. I think Thackeray is somebody's. I think I've known somebody with that as a Maybe, last name, but it's but not. It that's needs the, to be stopped. The first like name. It, where Gino's comes from in, 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 in uh, Portugal, wherever. <laughs> uh, they have rules against. Gino <laughs> They have rules against these kind of foobar practices. This, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. Oh, well, I am kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> like in Australia and, and probably the Zealand, they say, hey, you can't name your kid Queenie. You can't name your name kid Lord. You can't name your kid Jesus. You, your kid President. You can't name, you know, any, there's like a giant list of, it's like, it is against the law uh, to name your kids all these things. And yeah, it wasn't, we need to just start with that. Wasn't kind of 2.0 uh, the name that somebody wanted to name their kid, and and they said no. Okay, you got to at least have some letters. T H X eleven eleven thirty eight. That's okay, but just two point oh. That that doesn't work, man. We but yeah, the, you know what I thought was funny was <laughs> I put on there in number two on that list of most popular names on the boy side was the name Declan, which. I don't know where that comes. I never heard. I mean, I, I saw that and I was just like, wow, that was that number two. I don't know if I knew that that was a name before. Yeah, that sounds super European to me. Declan <laughs> sounds like a secret agent or a Bond villain. Yeah, I or... just, I'd never heard it before. How could it be number two on the list if last year I didn't know it existed? But apparently it's super popular. And I, and I said, oh, Check when I posted it. I said, "Check this out. Here's a new source for me to get all of these really terrible names that I can use in my stories. stories." And I said, "Look for a Declan to be in a future story of mine." And the, the first comment was from a listener saying, "Hey, I have a nephew named Declan." And then the next comment was, "Me too." <laughs> yeah, so do I. It's and then I, I commented and said, "Well, it's number two on the list, so everybody must have a nephew named Declan." Be- Although she, her. Uh, nephew spelt it with a Y. Declan oh, with a Y. And is it a girl name? No, I think it was still a boy. Oh, okay, he shouldn't be allowed to do that either. <laughs> Again, freedom isn't free, guys. <laughs> there, there are soldiers that are putting their lives on the line, and they are killing brown people so that you can name your kid a girl's name? No. No. <laughs> I don't know. I I guess we should, shouldn't. I shouldn't judge. But as a writer, it's fun. And you and I have done it a lot. I mean, I had Brecken as a, as a character in this biggest story that I wrote this year. And that came about from me asking you. I sent you a text while I was at work. It said, I need a really ugly millennial name for an ugly little girl. <laughs> and I think you sent me two or you sent me three. And one of them was Brecklin. And I was just like, oh, oh, man. Ew. That that sounds like something that you have to drill out of the back of someone's molar 
that's awful. And somehow I ended up losing the L. But there are some ugly names out there. And I guess one person's Thackeray is another person's, you know, Anne. But I, I guess they want their kids to feel like they stand out or special or what? What is the reasoning behind? Okay, two of your kids have effed up names, right? Do they? And then one of them has like a super archaic name that only like a chipmunk or something would have. <laughs> and so I'm wondering. And then the, there's one that has a normal name, but it's spelled wrong, right? And you had to have done this on purpose. Yeah, you know that was that was one of the things that I I said when I responded back to the person who said, "Hey, my nephew's name is Declan." I said, "Well, yeah, I mean, I guess when it comes down to it, my kids' names aren't all that normal either. I think they're fine and normal, but they're a little different. Especially one of them has a really different sh- her name. Nobody can say. Nobody right. can say it. They always pronounce it wrong, and she gets frustrated with it. She doesn't like it, and I feel bad. Well, I think the first couple of years after you had her, I I would say it wrong. My and then go, oh wait, 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 and then I would say it wrong again. <laughs> like I my, knew I had said it wrong, and I would say it wrong, <laughs> trying to correct myself. My dad still says it wrong. People st- people that should know well, also say it wrong. Uh, but your dad has so many kids. There's no way you can yeah. keep track of the grandkids. Yeah, that's that's probably right? true. Can you keep track of all of your, I, his no, grandkids? I, mm, no, I can't. Well, I, I just I, I don't know. I, I Like I was saying, I think part of it is they want the child to feel like they're a unique and beautiful snowflake. But, <laughs> right. Like when I was growing up, my cousin's best friend, his female cousin, best friend was Razmika. Wow. And uh, something comes to your mind uh-huh. when I say Razmika. And, and it looks a little bit like Nicki Minaj. But it was a white kid named Razmika. Come on, dude. That ain't right either. Let's go back down to uh, New Zazland, and where it's against the law to be oh. a kid Razmika. Okay. I think the kids today, or the kids today, those kids they're, today they're, that are having their line, kids and it. naming their kids they're things. To, America Online. Those kids today that are getting names, I think their parents are possibly trying to avoid the I went to school with 27 Jennifers thing. Because that's, I don't know, I I have an unusual name. There's not a lot of people that are named Big out there. So a none on e- on Facebook, apparently. <laughs> that's right. And so I didn't come across people with the same name as me growing up. And if I ever do come across, if somebody says that, and it, it freaks me out to hear somebody calling my name, but not talking to me. It's really weird to me. But lots of people are just named like Scott. I was part of a soccer uh, fan club for a while, and I swear nine-tenths of the guys <laughs> that were there were named Scott somehow. And so we all had to just come up with nicknames or or what else to call each other because Scott uh, would just turn every head in the place. So it didn't work. And, you know, there's a lot of people that are Mike or whatever that every time you hear your name, you know, I don't know how you get used to it, how you deal with it. How do you know that people aren't calling you when you hear somebody saying your name? <laughs> yeah, see, I have an unusual name, too. And, well, I mean, it's not unusual, but, but atypical. And uh, th- there's a girl at work who claims to have a boyfriend in Canada. And that's always a, a, <laughs> a red flag where you're just like, are you, are you alone? And so you, you can tell me. It's all right. Yeah, you'll find someone. I promise. Uh, no, you don't have to keep telling. And she's like, no, he's in Lethbridge, Ontario. And I was like, no, you know, Lethbridge, you just made that Ontario. up. There's no such place as Ontario. Come on. <laughs> It's okay. Do you need a hug? And she said that her made-up boyfriend in Canada has the exact same name as me, even the same spelling. And I was, I was like, no, no, he doesn't. And she's like, yeah, and it's short for Richelieu. I was like, bullshit. And <laughs> I, I was like, that. you know, if you're going to make up a boyfriend so that I leave you alone, you know, make up a more believable story than that. It's weird. Yeah, I, I, neither of us have names that people... I mean, well, with yours, maybe... Because, you know, it's also a word. Uh-huh. You'll hear it a lot more. You know, some guy's calling his wife. 
and you're like, well, why does he keep calling me and, and, and saying honey? But I don't know. Anyway, I'm sorry. How do we get on this? <laughs> oh, okay. Did that affect how you, why you named your children, what you named them, having a name that was unusual? I don't think so. I, I just picked names that I liked or was denied picking names that I like, I should say. And my wife picked the names that she liked is generally what happened. And the names that I liked either had to be middle names or had to go on the scrap pile. Have we talked about this before on the show? <laughs> I don't know. Because you wanted to name a da- your first daughter Persephone. <laughs> and I remember you telling me this story a decade ago, right? And I was like, Persephone? Oh, that's f- that poor girl. And all these years later, uh, it's grown on me to the point where I was just like, yeah, if I had eight girls, <laughs> one of them would probably be Persephone. I might name the eighth one Persephone. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's just gained in in my appreciation for it because I've never known anybody with that name. And it's kind of pretty. And, and Persephone, you know, in the whole Greek pantheon or whatever was beautiful, right? And that's kind of a neat thing. Right? Yeah, I don't know. I've seen Persephone portrayed in Greek movies recently now. Like she was in the Percy Jackson movie. She was... Like the first one or the really bad second one? I think it was the first one. Because okay. I don't think I saw the second one. She was the wife of... Shoot. Hades. Hades, thank you. Um, what's her name? Uh, Rosario Dawson played her. Okay. Right? I don't remember. <laughs> She's the one that's forced to spend right. Half the year she in spends half, half the after year after Underworld, and half the year she gets to go out and yeah, she gets to come up to see to her mother. To Detroit for half the year, and the rest of the year she can be in Lethbridge, Ontario. At yes, which uh, yeah, it's funny because Lethbridge is actually in Alberta. You might no, want to you might want to call that girl on it. <laughs> it's like have you heard my girlfriend in Canada. Her name is Alberta. She lives in Calgary, and later it's that she lives in Calgary. Her name. Wait, damn it's it, still, still the same. same. You blew later it again. But yeah, from what I've seen, Persephone, uh, she's the daughter of Demeter, who is the goddess of the harvest, I believe. So then Hades comes and steals her away, and when she gets stolen away, then. Demeter is very sad, and winter comes. Oh, okay. And is it she doesn't actually affect the harvest. It's her mother that affects the harvest. I mean, that affects the weather. Right. And she, Demeter is so sad that she's gone that winter comes, and winter stays. And finally, people get Hades to agree to allow Persephone to come out for half of the year. And when she finally comes out, that's when spring returns. And then she goes back down, and that was one winter. And so that's kind of the story behind the seasons is the the legend of that. But, yeah, when she was in I saw the Percy on, on Jackson. Cosmos. The other day they were talking about that. that yeah. The Tyson dude was was explaining. The seasons. Sometimes yeah, that's, that's what, he, what he explained. It's good that he's finally come to understand the truth. But, yeah, in the Percy Jackson movie, she was just like this creepy goth underworld type chick but i I don't know it's just she's she's not portrayed as necessarily see i think of that whole myth of the you know she goes down and then her mother's so happy when she comes back and yay and she brings spring and all this kind of stuff but it seems like people more focus on she's the goth queen of the underworld kind of a thing so i don't know maybe it's better that she didn't wind up getting named persephone my idea was that we would call her percy for short and everybody said, no, that's a boy's name. And yeah, Declan with a Y. It didn't happen. Yeah, and I wanted to name my son Joe. I just Joe, not Joe. Short Joseph. Joe. It would have been Joseph, but you Joseph. know, you call him Joe. Joseph. <laughs> and yeah, my wife would not stand for that either. She wouldn't uh, stand for it. She wouldn't, no. She sat because down. Because that's as, as out there as Persephone. Yeah, she, she hates the name Joseph for some reason. She she Well, she hates the name Joe and more so the name Joey. But she says Joe just sounds like the guy that's working at the gas station with Joe and a little patch sewn onto his outfit or whatever. What does Joe mean to you? Pro- I don't know why I started doing this, but in a lot of my stuff that I wrote early on, like in our screenplay class, for example, that we did our screenwriting class, the character, my Mary Sue, the person that was based on me, was always named Joe. And recently I tried to get my wife, for the for the newest baby who was just born two years ago, I tried to get her to agree to name 
him, not just Joe, but I wanted to name our son Joe Montana. <laughs> she said we will allow him to be named Joe Mama before we name him Joe Montana. <laughs> but she, yeah, she wouldn't go for that either. Does but, Joe Montana mean that much to you? Oh, I love Joe. He's probably my favorite football player ever. He's the greatest quarterback of all time. And yeah, he's an amazing dude. And he's never, you know, beaten a woman or a child or or uh, been, you know, gone to jail for using drugs or selling drugs. He's never killed anyone. So he's really uncommon among football players. Plus, he's got a normal name. Yeah. Although he's, he's, he's just he's, called he's, Joe. He's up there. He's been around for a long time. Well, yeah. Well, he, he's been retired for a long time. But, yeah, I remember once in the uh, 80s there was a... Uh, comedian who was talking about how joe montana had the toughest name of anybody in the world and he's like i mean there could be just the the flaming gay guy who's talking oh yes it was me and then bruce and joe montana (laughs) and he would drop his voice and do you know he he couldn't say (laughs) yep he couldn't say it in a gay voice because it was that tough of a name. It does sound, it makes me think of like Indiana Jones too when you hear the name Joe Montana. But Well, uh, I mean, it's kind of, you know, you have a state name. Right. I don't know how we got on it. Oh, Jackson <laughs> with an X. Yes, have Jackson you, with an X. You say you know someone named Jackson with an X? I've seen, I can't say that I know this person personally, but I have seen somewhere i swear i've seen maybe it's on one of my kids class lists or in their yearbook or something like that where they had kids in their class that were jackson with an x that's just one of those things everybody spells the name different if they can which seems frustrating to me like i'd hate to be a teacher in a school these days where you get the roll and you're just like, uh, uh, and you try and call a roll. Oh, oh, worse yet, a substitute teacher. If you were a substitute teacher that had to walk into a class today and call the roll, dude, you would not have a chance. You have seen the key and Yes, I have seen that. <laughs> Very funny. I, I realize we're not really talking about the holidays and I, I, I'm not completely sorry. <laughs> Well, we can talk We've about been it. We've doing the show a long time. But there's one other thing that you you knew I would address it because I paused <laughs> while we were reading the Yeah, the I, was, I was waiting for you to actually say something about it when you got to that point in the story. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's not the elephant in the room because nobody else would have noticed it. I, in fact, I didn't notice it the first time I read your story. It wasn't oh. until tonight reading it aloud. I'll... I'll Sum up, and then you can tell me whether I'm right or wrong. But okay. over the years, and you haven't done it this year, so bless you for it. <laughs> but you, I'm about to. You have enjoyed complaining, if you can enjoy complaining, that every time you see a Christmas movie or a TV special, there's a character who doesn't believe in Santa Claus. And invariably, on the show, it comes out that Santa Claus is real. And it bothers you because if santa claus is real then why would there be people that don't believe in santa claus i mean it's just like you know i don't believe in bosnia (laughs) it's like well we're coming live from bosnia right now and it's not a war zone right now but we are in bosnia and the guy says no i don't believe in bosnia (laughs) basically that's my interpretation of your complaint and god knows you've said it enough times that i should have gotten it but correct me if i'm wrong no, that's that's pretty much it. The, the the thing that that bothers me the most, like for example, you take the movie The Santa Claus with an E. Yes, with an E. And in this movie, uh, Tim Robbins, t- Tim Horton, Tim. Hey, now you've again. now you've made me forget the real yeah, name. I was about John. to say Tim it. Allen. Tim Allen he scares Santa so that he falls off the roof and dies horribly. He breaks his neck. <laughs> yes. And this was a movie for children. Yes. Uh, that's what I've always, I remember asking other people, do, do your kids freak out when 
Tim Allen kills Santa Claus? He, he, does that freak them out? The Santa Claus dies in this movie? And he said, no, more, and everybody's more like, of the scene where she, he rapes Mrs. Claus. <laughs> everybody's just like, no, I, no, no, nobody's ever, they never said a thing. No kid cares that Santa dies, apparently. But anyways, <laughs> so Santa dies and Tim Allen has to take over. And he becomes Santa. And the whole time he's fighting against Judge Reinhold who doesn't believe in Santa Claus and he's now the new he's boyfriend or whatever wife, with his right? wife. Right. So he has to break through and show these adults that Santa's real. The thing is believing in Santa is not like believing in God because people, you know, you pray and then uh, something happens, a miracle or whatever it is, kind of a thing and, you know, it, you can say, no, it was because of this, or you can say it was just a coincidence, that kind of stuff. There's all sorts of different, you know, things, you know, it's science and this happens. And of course, that's the way it went, or I'm not explaining it very well, I have to admit. But with Santa, he comes to your house and he leaves presents. If he doesn't exist, then where the hell did the presents come from? The parents obviously would know that they didn't put them there themselves, which is what happens in the real world. But if there really is a Santa, then Santa came, he brought the presents, and they're there. It just seems weird. That's always what they focus on in <laughs> movies all the time. Is Santa real or not real? And I guess maybe they just assume that that's a important thing in children's life and so they need to make a story about that but there seems like there's so many options that you could go with with a story that has nothing to do with that just go from the that's what i did here it was just if santa's real then he shows up and he's going to be real and the part where you stopped and paused in the reading and went oh he did it is when santa appears and craig. The, the craig yeah the father craig just says what santa's here already He's supposed to come later. He doesn't go, what the hell? Santa, what is, Santa's real? Or anything like that. Because Craig would know that he was real because he didn't put the damn presents out. If Santa brought presents, then Santa brought presents. And it's always the adults that are the non-believers in these Christmas movies. Well, sometimes there can be an older kid that yeah, tries little... to convince our main character kid that Santa isn't real and they're always proven wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and that I can understand a lot better. It's still, I, I mean, I, again, this only bothers you. It doesn't bother <laughs> me and it doesn't bother anybody else on earth. But it's still bothersome that in children's entertainment, when so many parents, you know, are trying to shelter their children about the awful, awful truth about sexual intercourse, that you would allow in children's entertainment the question to be brought up at all that Santa isn't real, the the, yeah. the, the the concept to be put in their mind that there are people that don't believe in Santa or, and or, you know, because it just, yeah, it seems like, whoa, 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 we don't want the movies to put that spark into a kid. You, we want the movies to uphold the tradition, if you will, the myth. Right. Yeah. That's, whatever you want to that's call something it. at work that uh, my boss has said. She's like, you guys never, ever, ever hint at the fact that there is no Santa. <laughs> on the news because that's the last thing we want is parents calling us up and complaining that we just ruined Christmas for their children by saying this crap. And I, I mean, I mean, parents suck. They suck. And I know it more than most people do because I deal with them every day and they suck. <laughs> and you as a representative of the race have a lot of, of apology to do, but yeah, it's, you don't hear parents complain that there's a movie where, you know, it's like I, little Billy doesn't believe in Santa anymore. So, you know, he's not going to get any presents or whatever. Um, instead of, you know, it's like, well, little Billy's been naughty this year, so he's not going to get any presents. You know what I mean? Uh huh. It's, it's, it would be so easy to just change that line. Right. I don't know. I mean, so many times the punchline of these movies is, holy cow, Santa is real. And, you know, it's, uh, the adult or the grouchy old guy that lives across the, the way or the, the teenage brother who's too cool to believe goes, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Santa is real, which is it's got to be a cousin or a, a half sibling to the God is real 
argument in a movie. Yeah. Thing. It's, it's, because I, mean, I don't want to say they're the same thing, but I'm saying right here in front of you, they're the same thing. Something that some people believe in that gives hope to them or, or, or comfort or whatever that other people don't believe in. And that, that sometimes it's hard to maintain this belief or this, this, this faith or whatever, whatever you want to call it in the face of so many people saying, I don't believe in Santa. And it's like, oh, I hear Tommy. Let me tell you how Santa really works. Let me tell you where babies come from. <laughs> the tooth fairy. He's yeah. You know, I actually had a, I actually had a friend who he didn't have kids yet, but he was married and he was, you know, at the point where maybe he might have kids at some point soon. And we were talking about Santa and he was thinking and he, he was religious and he's just like, I don't know that I should do the Santa thing because what are they going to think when they come to realize that Santa isn't real? Are they, is, are, are they going to start questioning other things that I've been telling them are real? Are they going to start questioning whether God is real? Yeah, I, I guess I can understand that being an issue. Maybe that's why it's always the focus of these Christmas movies. Maybe it's just kind of a stand-in for the religious part of the holiday because, you know, they they can use Santa instead and not offend the people who aren't religious and don't want to have to listen to more of that kind of stuff. I just... That I, is a, it's a weird thing because it's Christmas. It's a Christian holiday or, you know, pagan, appropriate <laughs> Christian holiday. And yet Santa is several rungs on the ladder less controversial. Mm -hmm. than God or Jesus. And yet, it, you know, he's inextricably linked with a religious observance, with a religious tradition of a, you know, a Christian thing rather than... Or Kwanzaa or whatever yeah. else. And, and so, it, anyhow, that's just, it's, it's, it's weird. But like you said, yeah, he's a stand-in. He's a substitute, maybe. That's, that's cool. That's a... Yeah, maybe it's just a, another way of talking about the existence of God versus the existence of, I don't know. I just wonder why it's always the same thing. I swear there's new Christmas specials and new Christmas movies coming out all the time. And you watch them and it's like, oh, that, that one was the same as the last one, was the same as the one before. Why can't there just be a movie where Santa exists and everybody just accepts that fact? It's not the centerpiece of the story. There's other things happening. And I guess there are Christmas movies like that, but it that just means they don't deal with Santa at all. Whenever Santa's... A part of it, that's what it's all about. There's like, you know, Christmas with the Cranks or something. Doesn't worry about that. Was that Tim Allen too? Yeah, I think it was. Huh. How about that? It's all about Tim Allen. Today's show. Infinity <laughs> and beyond. I, I don't think it has anything to do with Tim Allen. Oh, anyhow, well, so you finally got your wish. or you? you <laughs> now nah, that's, that's a weird way of saying it. You, you, you got to implement your idea. In a story, and uh, it just seemed, and, and it just it stuck out for me because <laughs> I knew exactly where that came from, right? And I'm sure I've written something before where you, when you read it, you're like, "Oh, I know what he's saying here. <laughs> I know where this came from." But that's 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 writing. That's you you write what you know, or you write what you're passionate about, or you you answer questions that you've had in your head, right? And, uh, yeah, it just seemed to me like if Santa was going to show up and stove in this man's head with a candy cane made of steel that Santa's probably real. And a parent would know that because they came down the next morning and there was all this crap in the living room that wasn't there before. So, yeah, I just kind of went with that. I don't know if, if other people thought it was weird like, like you did when you saw it the second time around or if they all just accepted it or or what but there you go that's I, my thing i don't imagine anybody noticed it until i brought it up man because it's, <laughs> it's not overt you know what i mean it's just instead of the first reaction of who well, are you it's are you santa what are you doing here already you know it just you you we missed two sentences the who the hell are you why it's me craig santa and santa what the hell are you doing here already uh, so we missed those two sentences, but I don't know that anybody else would have noticed those two sentences. Were gone. <laughs> anyway, it just, it, it's weird what we choose to talk about 
on these episodes is where the conversation goes where it wants to go. And uh, I wish we had more episodes of the Dune Steve out there and we could get together and do them more. Like I said, this is the third time in the last more than six months, in the last eight months I've been here. And so, you know, there's just, there's, we're not overflowing with episodes. Yeah, but we'll keep it coming. We'll have to get together again soon because we only have so many episodes in the hopper and we'll have to record a few more. Although we may just do them via Skype. So. And, and yeah, this was supposed to be recorded before I felt sick. Oh no, it was right in the middle, before my voice started to change. And the other night, you and I were supposed to get together. I think you said you were going to call around 10 o'clock. And so around, what was it 10, 10.30, 11? What time did you actually call? It was actually about 11. Okay, so around I... 10.30, I took a, a, a NyQuil because I was getting sick. And, and then you didn't call. <laughs> and suddenly it hit. And I was like, well, I'm going to lay here just for a minute. And then you called... And I don't remember if I picked up or was I was like, uh, it was one of those things where I felt like it was at the bottom of a deep, deep <laughs> hole. And, and I clawed my way up and I was like, eh, I looked around for a second, but I was already sliding back down the hole. And I guess I sent to you, it said, I fell asleep. And you're like, well, were you going to do this thing? And you're like, yeah, if you want me to. And you're like, yeah, you sound like you're sleepy. <laughs> if you just want to sleep. And I'm like, you're sure? And then there was no more conversation. <laughs> I woke up the next morning. I still had my shoes on. I was in my pants and shirt and all that stuff. It was just like, oh. it was like it was like the times when my wife wakes up and says stuff in the middle of the night, and then the next morning I ask her about it, and she doesn't remember having ever said a thing, even though we had a full conversation about several things that she thought was important enough to ask me. It was like that. You 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 got in touch with me. Yo, I don't feel like we talk anymore. I, but I'll make it up to you. It's okay if you name him Joseph. And he's like, "Honey, you said it. I I swear." <laughs> yeah. The next day when I talked to you, you were just like, "Yeah, oh, I I I never t- told you. I saw that you tried to." To IM me there, and I never responded to you, and I'm sorry, I never responded. I'm like, no, I talked to you. You said this and this, and <laughs> <laughs> just like, oh, what? okay. Well, I just wanted to call and say sorry. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty funny, I thought. But yeah, so we've made it. We've got an episode. We talked about Santa. Well, and this is our Christmas episode, and uh, I, I'm assuming this is our last episode for 2014. I would think that would be pretty likely. We. I had a goal at the beginning of the year during our drive up to New Media Expo and stuff that we were going to do way better in 2014 than we did in 2013. And it wouldn't be hard. Yeah. We'd have to do an episode in 2014 to do better than 2013. For, but for a while there, we were doing really, really well, I think. And then it sort of fell by the wayside. We still did way better. Yeah, I think we year. at least succeeded in definitely outdoing 2013. I think... I think the triple word score contest was really kind of a savior for us and that we had all these stories ready to go that were short, not too difficult to produce, and we were able to put them out pretty often. And for the most part, we made sure to do what we had planned, which was to have a regular episode in between each of the triple word scores. So it was almost like the triple word scores just kind of did themselves and then all we had to do was concentrate on the other episodes in between. So it would never seemed like it was too hard to deal with. And that was nice. And um, we still have several triple word score sh- stories to go. Um, yeah, and that's too bad. We should have gotten rid of those a long, long time. Yeah, we should have been through them by now. But I think <laughs> the fact that we insisted on having a regular episode in between each one made that difficult. The one time we didn't have an episode in between was... When the episode was on that gets my goat as part of the uh, Halloween extravaganza, so we did have an episode we did. in between everything. But yeah, again, we wouldn't have had nearly as many episodes if people hadn't offered to produce for us. That's right. And you know, thank you to everybody that's done that, and also those that have done it and still haven't heard their episode. Yeah, we're gonna get those things done. Uh, we always feel rejuvenated. In January, it's like Persephone comes up from <laughs> from Hades, and it's probably because at the end of the year everybody looks back and they're all contemplating what they accomplished, what they failed at, and they say, "Well, it's a new year. It's a chance in this new year to reassess 
where uh, we're at and, and where we would like to be. And, and I certainly get, and I, almost everybody does, a, a boost of ambition and stuff at the beginning of the year. It's like, okay, I'm going to do better. And, and so, the, you know, hopefully that will happen again and you will get to hear the rest of the Triple Word Score winners. But if you would like to produce a story for us, let us know and we'll get you on there. I think we've got a couple of stories and you and I frankly just have to be more ambitious with our own stories and say, hey, we're going to send this to you. It's a story that I wrote. I don't know if it's any good. Make it good. And, <laughs> you know, you know rewrite all, it. <laughs> if I could do that with all of my stories, there would be very few of, of my stories that no one has read or heard. Um, just because, you know, I, and this is a, that gets my goat. And this is a conversation we've had a million times. I don't know how to get over my fear of, of you know, people saying that things aren't good or that they're terrible or whatever. But again, it's a new year or it will be soon. And a chance to uh, try again to overcome this <laughs> weakness of mine. Yeah, another one of the goals that we had from back then when we talked about it uh, on our way back from, or our way to, or I think it was back. back. Yeah, one way back from New Media Expo was to include more of our own stuff into the show. And I think that's a goal we've been kind of working on for a couple of years. But I think this year we probably did better than we ever had before. We had a lot of our stories. We were courageous enough to put the mar well courageous i think is more your issue you were courageous enough to put your stories on and i was not completely lazy and i actually wrote some stories on my end that we were able to put on to the show and i think uh, that 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 worked out pretty well too and hopefully we can continue that into the new year and really uh push toward that you know i can do more stuff like we did in in today's show where i sat down and wrote a story for the show to get something ready. And, uh, you know, I'll probably have to write a lot more 2,500 word stories and a lot fewer 25,000 word stories because the effort that it would take to get the story that I wrote just before Dear Santa onto the show. I mean, it's, it's half of a novel. It's, it's, that's a lot of freaking words and a lot of work. If we were to put that on the show, maybe that'll still happen. I know that there was a story that you wanted to put on the show. You sent me a copy of it a long time ago. This is like four years ago or something. You said, maybe we can do a podcast of this story. I don't know how many words it was, but when I printed it out, it was like a hundred pages. And yeah, I mean, there are stories that we could do like that. You just recently finished publishing your story, Birth of a Sidekick, in four parts on your uh, Rish Outfield, or Rish Outcast, I should say, podcast. Um, and that's a, that was a long story. That was in the 20,000 words range, wasn't it? I don't know. But, but uh, yeah, it was four half-hour episodes. Right. So that's, that's a pretty long story. And uh, so obviously we can do it. Heck, you can do it. I didn't even have any part in it, so so uh, it's it's something that's possible even without me involved. So add me in, and then it's not possible. But <laughs> yeah, one one last thing that we were trying to do that we forgot to do this episode and last was uh, announcer man had urged us to plug stuff that we have done you know like you can go out and buy this story somewhere or you can go and listen to this podcast or you can go listen to that audiobook kind of thing that's something we got to do more of in 2015 yes we definitely should should we do one of those right now and now it's time for shill my shite oh i thought we were calling it go plug yourself or shill my shite oh don't really. okay <laughs> can you say that like johnny carson shill my shite i know i'm not really a johnny carson yeah. impressionist you are correct <laughs> that's, that's right it's uh, what what are, what are we calling it an outro man <laughs> oh oh my shill my shite is it <laughs> see you he said it through your teeth, <laughs> Johnny. Yeah, so I guess we're calling it Shill My Shite now, which means that this story is shite. But <laughs> I don't know if I want to admit to that. So recently, I decided I had I, I made like a five year plan to uh, go from being what I am now, which is a chump, to being a writer. Basically, my I, my plan is to be a writer who lives off writing. Someone who does it as a li- for a living, 
within the next five years. And so goal, one of the goals, I mean, a lot of the goals are, you know, write a certain amount of words each month, write a certain amount of stories or chapters or whatever each month. One of them is publish the stories that I have already written. And so the first month I failed and didn't get one published. Basically, the, the learning curve of making it, formatting it the way it's supposed to be has been a little daunting to me. But I finally put in the time and I got my first story published. It's a story that you all might know if you've been listening for a while. The story was called Through the Din of Silence. And it was a story that I knew didn't need a rewrite, didn't need any work done to it. It was ready to go as is. And so I figured I would use that as my first one. And yeah, I published it and it's available for purchase. There'll be a link in the show notes where you can find it. If I did it right, then it will show up in all the places that you can buy ebooks. You can find it at Barnes and Noble or Amazon or Smashwords, which is where it will be published to begin with, or et cetera, et cetera. So you can click on the link or you can just go, hopefully, to your favorite place to buy ebooks and buy it. Um, well, it's a yeah, short if story. If you're listening to this sometime next year, um, you can do a search for B.D. Anklevich, B.D., and maybe there'll be way more than just through the dinner time. Yeah, hopefully there will be because my goal is to publish two, at least two stories a month once I got it figured out. One story was the first month and then two stories from every month on after that. And yeah, so they are avail- it is available for you to purchase and enjoy. Check it out if you would like. I would like if you would like. So there you go. Uh, my shite has been shilled. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna come up with a an alternate title for that uh, segment. We'll uh, come up with New Year. We'll come up with ten alternate titles. How's that sound? Uh, anything would be better. <laughs> All right, so we have come to the end of this episode, our holiday episode, 2014. Thank you for listening. If you've listened through the years, thank you for uh, coming along this journey with us there was a guy recently who said he'd sat down and listened to all of our episodes i mean we got the email posthumously from him but <laughs> it was uh, forwarded you know by his estate but it uh, he sent it right before he took his own life <laughs> anyhow yeah he he was bleeding out he didn't quite get to hit sand but the, the medical examiner did it for him <laughs> but yeah thank you for people that have done that thanks for people that ask when our next episode's going to be you might think it's crazy, but maybe it's untrue. You might think it's that foolish. would be irritating. Foolish? Is that what it was? Damn. Uh, you might think that that would be irritating, but it's not. It's. It, I appreciate it when somebody says, hey, it's been a long time since you've had an episode, or hey, when's that episode going to air, or hey, where's my spy camera? I want my $2. <laughs> you know, there's any of these things. Yeah, it's, uh, it, is, it, it is definitely motivation. To have somebody that cares enough to ask about it will motivate us to do that. So thank you if you do. And yeah, I'd like to reiterate my thanks to everybody uh, who has helped us out this year. To our minions. <laughs> right. Those guys. Thanks for all, all the help. Without you guys helping us, there probably would have been maybe one episode this year. <laughs> so it, it it's really wonderful to have all the support we get from the from our listening community and yeah i'd like to wish everyone happy holidays merry christmas happy hanukkah what is it just happy kwanzaa what's kwanzaa does kwanzaa have a particular article what are they let's let's say festive kwanzaa okay a festive kwanzaa to you a super solstice oh really uh Uh, is there any other holidays? Uh, wonderful Pearl Harbor Day. That's right. Uh, a, a peaceful, jo- oh, a peaceful Pearl Harbor Day. Oh, that's better. A joyous birth of Elron Hubbard Day. It would be nice to. Uh, yeah, we just want to include congratulations, everybody. Congratulations, Charlie Manson, on your upcoming uh, nuptials. You know, just the just kind of the, the important holiday things that are going on. So yeah, happy holidays to all. And to all, a good night. Ho, ho, ho! Santa, really?
are you doing in here? <laughs> Looks like it's time you pick on someone your own size, you piece of shit. <laughs> All right, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Big Anklevich. Announcer man, put down that bottle. <laughs> I'm a chef for you. Good night. Good night. That brings us to the end of the show. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. So long, and thanks for all the fish. Take two. Can I fart? Uh, I would prefer you didn't. Oh. Because... They tend suck it back in somehow. They tend to linger. Mm. And I would rather not be smelling it for the rest of the night. Did I have to let it linger? (laughs) Yeah, did did you? Did I have to? Judge Reinhold, who doesn't believe in Santa Claus, and he's now the new boyfriend or whatever with his wife, right. Who played the wife? I don't remember. It was somebody. It was that, Surely I mean, somebody. Somebody that we knew, though, at the time. That we yeah, knew. I think so. The fact I that think. I remember Judge Reinhold's name is pretty impressive to me because I don't remember that kind of stuff much. What was the name of the girl in Liar Liar? The wife, the ex-wife in that. Maybe I'm confusing them a bit. In the back of my mind, it's the same woman. Could be. The one that was on news ra- radio. She had a Would you like me to turn on IMDb? No. Let's go. Okay. I think I may have even, I think Starship Sofa. Ooh, you. I don't think you could hear that, could you?